so um, <clears throat> you remember our, uh, that we were discussing uh, th th this uh, thing called uh, the De Laval nozzle, which is really, um, you know, something that was uh, initially thought of uh, in engineering circles. Um, and uh, in doing so, um, we essentially uh, came up with uh, this equation, which is, which relates the, uh, so this is a purely one dimensional flow. Okay, so this equation essentially relates the uh, the velocity and the derivative of the velocity with the area and the derivative of the area. And an area of what? Well, area of the pipe, right? The area of the pipe can be, you know, varying like this, right? The cross-sectional area, right? So this is what we're talking about, and, and, and it can vary as a function of x. So a can vary as a function of x. And the question we were asking is how, and, and this is the Mach number, of course, right? So the question we were asking is how does the flow behave uh, with, with the change in area as, 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 it, as it passes? And um, uh, does it conform with intuition, right? And what we found out was, well, uh, co let's first consider subsonic flows for, for in other words, uh, the case where uh, the Mach number is less than one, right? So, and uh, we, we find uh, we, uh, the, the area itself is always larger than zero, isn't it? So, <clears throat> when, for instance, when, uh, when dA dx is less than zero, in other words, the, the channel the area is pinched like this it's somewhat like you're pinching you know a garden hose you know so so the area is decreasing which is what this is when the area is decreasing you expect that the fluid flow the fluid squirts out uh, at, at a at a higher speed here as compared to the speed here right and that is really what happens here you see when m, m squared is less than 1 uh, m is less than 1 this quantity is negative and and uh, what happens is this quantity is negative therefore when this quantity is negative then then this has to be positive okay so the flow accelerates when da dx is less than 0 and the flow decelerates when da dx is greater than 0 or a diverging nozzle. This is also something, so in, in this case, dA dx, in this case, and in this case, for this, and in this case, dA dx is greater than zero. And so we normally, you know, ex expect that uh, flows when, uh, when when the cross-sectional area is increased, the flow decelerates, and then when the cross-sectional area is, is decreased, uh, in other words, for instance, if if you pinch the pipe, the flow accelerates, and that and that that it's okay. I mean, as far as long as you know the Mach number is less than one, uh, that behavior is indeed reproduced. The thing is, though, so uh, subsonic flows do conf conform to intuition. But what about supersonic flows, right? And we find some strange behavior in supersonic flows. Uh, we find that because m is greater than 1, and this is always positive, right? So the signs of du dx and da dx are the same. Because, you know, a and u are all positive, so there's no, the, the, there's no scope that this can, you know, uh, change signs. So if da dx is, is negative, in other words, in a, in a situation like this, where the channel is being squeezed, you find that uh, the flow decelerates. So, the, so dA dx is negative and du, du dx is also negative. So the flow decelerates in a converging channel, which is opposite uh, to our intuition um, about subsonic flows. So for supersonic flows, it's strange, right? And if dA dx is positive, in other words, like this, dA dx is positive, du dx is also positive. In other words, the flow, supersonic flow, accelerates in a diverging channel, right? So this is the strange thing about 
oh, supersonic flows and uh, we will we will see how, what connection this has uh, we will explore this a little more and then we will go on to see what connection this has to um, astrophysical jets right okay this is what one would call a nozzle on the left hand side these are these are all and these are what are called a nozzle is is something that that uh, as the name implies it increases the speed of the flow right and the diffuser is something as the name implies something that decreases the, the speed of the flow and and spreads the flow around for instance if you were uh, trying to spray paint something you don't want a nozzle right if you're trying to spray paint what you do is you you inject the paint at high velocity and 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 then you you want the paint to diffuse uh, when it flows out so that uh, the droplets uh, nicely you know diffuse and they cover a large area so that's that's what a diffuser is right so for uh, mark number less than 1 this would be a nozzle what would be a nozzle for Mach number less than one? This kind of situation where uh, dA dx less than zero, right? You see the dA dx is indeed the, the area is decreasing as a function of x. So this would be a nozzle and this would be a diffuser. In, 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 in this case, the cross-sectional area is increasing, in other words, right so this would be a diffuser why is this a diffuser because as subsonic flows pass through uh, you know a diverging channel their speed decreases and the flow diffuses right so this conforms to intuition for supersonic flows however it's this kind of a thing where dA dx is actually greater than zero it's a diverging channel Okay, it's this kind of a diverging channel that acts as a nozzle. In other words, supersonic flows accelerate when they pass through a diverging channel. Therefore, uh, it, uh, you know, a diverging channel acts as a nozzle for supersonic flows. Here, okay? like this. The top half is for subsonic flows where Mach number is less than 1 and the bottom half is for supersonic flows where the Mach number is larger than 1. Right. So uh, when the Mach number is larger than 1, uh, contrary to intuition, it's this kind of a diverging channel. In other words, uh, a situation where dA dx is greater than 0 that acts as, as a as a nozzle and in this kind of, it's, it's this kind of a converging channel where right the area decreases as a function of x this situation acts as a diffuser it's exact opposite uh, of the situation for uh, subsonic flows right so just wanted to emphasize that a little more uh, before we proceed and now let us go ahead finally uh, putting these two things together this is what's uh, uh, finally uh, this is what's normally called the de Laval nozzle okay so what you have is a situation is a pipe whose cross-sectional area is decreasing here until it reaches a throat and then it increases okay and so in this region up until here And from here to here, here onwards, right? And right here, exactly here, is equal to zero. It's less than zero to the left, is equal to zero exactly at this point called the throat, right? So this is called. the throat right so exactly at the throat uh, it's equal to zero the, uh, the derivative of dA dx is equal to zero and to the right of the throat dA dx is larger than zero so this is the situation so imagine you have a subsonic flow 
right? So a subsonic flow would have Mach number less than one, right? So a subsonic flow is passing through a nozzle, right? It accelerates. In other words, the Mach number is initially less than one. It, it becomes larger and larger because it's accelerating. We are assuming that the sound speed remains constant, of course. Okay, the sound speed does not change. The sound speed, the speed of sound is the same. So if the flow is accelerating, well then, in, and if the sound speed is the same, it remains constant, then naturally the Mach number is increasing. It's increasing from Mach, from less than one, and it comes to a point where at the throat, uh, the Mach number is exactly equal to one. Okay. And beyond that, what happens is, you know, uh, the flow continues to accelerate. So beyond here, what, what happens is anything beyond here, anything beyond Mach number equal to one becomes Mach number larger than one, of course. And so, and we know that super, for supersonic flows, a diverging channel is a nozzle, isn't it? So uh, to the right of this, you have supersonic flows. And, and for supersonic flows, the diverging channel is a nozzle. So the flow continues to accelerate and becomes, and the Mach number becomes larger and larger. So all the way from to the left to the right, the Mach number is increasing. Okay, the Mach number was initially less than one. It passes through one and then it becomes greater than one. All through the Mach number is, is increasing, okay. Uh, all the way from left to right. The Mach number keeps increasing. But the shape of the nozzle is different on the left and the right. Why is that? Because on the left, the flow is subsonic and therefore in order to increase the Mach number or in order to, more, more accurately, in order to accelerate the flow and therefore to increase the Mach number, uh, you have to have a, you know, a converging channel. Okay, whereas on the right, once you pass what's called the sonic point, so this is in other words u over c sub s is equal to 1 right and so this is called the sonic point for obvious reasons right the flow speed is equal to the sound speed so this is, you, you at, right at the throat, you have what's called the sonic point, right? And to the right of, of, of this, the flow becomes, starts becoming supersonic. So if you have to ensure that the flow keeps accelerating, and therefore the Mach number keeps increasing to the right, also you need to have a diverging channel now, because we know that for supersonic flows, a diverging channel acts as a nozzle. Right, so this is this clever, you know, um, situation uh, where um, you have, um, you know, the De Laval nozzle is this clever situation where uh, you ensure uh, that, uh, you know, uh, so essentially the De Laval nozzle ensures that uh, the flow keeps accelerating as it passes from subsonic through the sonic point which is right to supersonic which is so let me let me do this one and uh, let me show you this once again. So the De Laval nozzle is a device which ensures that the flow keeps accelerating as it passes from 
a subsonic flow through the sonic point where m equals uh, the Mach number equal to 1 to supersonic. So this is what a de Laval nozzle does. Importantly, so this is an example of a transonic flow. Why transonic flow? Because it's, it's something that transitions, uh, this is a flow that transitions from being subsonic through the sonic point into supersonic. Okay. Importantly, the sonic transition, in other words, the transition through the sonic point where m equals 1 is smooth. i.e. no discontinuities. Such as shocks. This is very important. It's not just that the a De Laval nozzle is not just a device that you know ensures that you 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 pass smoothly from a subsonic flow to a supersonic flow. Yes, that is one thing through a sonic point, but also it's a device that ensures that this transition happens smoothly. Okay, so you have to engineer the DADX very carefully. Okay, uh, the throat has to be uh, you know um, uh, the throat. This one, I mean, it's. There are many ways in which you can transition from a DADX less than zero to a DADX larger than zero, right? I mean, this this the the converging nozzle can be very sharp, for instance, and the diverging nozzle can also be very sharp. But you have to en en engineer the shape of the nozzle such that you ensure that the uh, you know that that the transition happens smoothly without any discontinuity, such as shocks. This is very important. There, you can transition from, remember, one can transition from, you know, greater than one to less than one through a shock. One can do that, okay? But a De Laval nozzle is something that does not do it this way. It ensures that the transition happens smoothly. Okay, right. So having emphasized this, let's go on. Yeah, so the trans tra so this, this, the sonic point happens where the DADX is equal to zero right here at the throat, right? Okay. Now, what does uh, again just to just to uh, re-emphasize wh what we were saying, um, the, uh, the De Laval nozzle is a device which effectively accelerates a high temperature, high pressure flow. Uh, well, a high temperature, high pressure low velocity. In fact, the high pressure and, and, and low velocity kind of go um, hand in hand. Okay, uh, you know, it, it's the flow, it's, it's uh, most of the, uh, when we say high pressure, what we're really saying is most of the energy is an internal energy of the gas. Okay, that's the same thing as saying high temperature. Okay, this and this uh, ensure that most of the energy uh, is in the internal energy of the gas and that it converts and, and, and the De Laval nozzle is something that converts this kind of a high, t high temperature, high pressure, low velocity gas to high velocity gas. Okay, in other words, the, the, the internal energy is converted into the kinetic energy of the bulk flow. That's when you get high speeds and in specifically the, the speeds are supersonic. 
It was originally designed for steam turbines and it's now often used in rocket engine nozzles and supersonic jet engines. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't know how many of you would have heard about supersonic jet engines. Um, long ago in the 80s was it yeah the concord uh, was was a very hard thing and th these were planes that uh, could could you know uh, cross the sonic barrier and become supersonic for various reasons they fell out of favor and so th those would be you know uh, one one uh, you know situation where something like the delaval nozzle would be used okay and i i urge you to check out this url it's very very interesting much of what we've discussed here is is is, is discussed here Okay, let us now uh, move over to discussing. So um, remember the reason this is an astrophysical fluids f course after all. And uh, the reason we're discussing the De La Val nozzle in, in, in such detail is because we want to see how the concept of a De La Val nozzle is applied to astrophysical jets. Now, what are astrophysical jets? I need to show you pictures, right? And an application, I should say. Uh, it's not so much application. The concept of a uh, the, uh, 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 De Laval nozzle is nicely applied here. That's what it is. Okay, so let me show you a picture. This. Right? So what is this? These are cosmic jets viewed by the very large array. And uh, uh, these are, are essentially what are called radio images. These images are images that are obtained at radio frequencies. Okay. And uh, this is one picture, this is another picture, this is yet another, this is yet another, okay? Uh, these are all different pictures. Let's just concentrate on this this first one, for instance. Let's just look at this, okay? This is good enough for our, our purposes. And uh, what you have here is a nucleus, okay? And from which you can see that there, there, there is matter, even from the picture you can see, you, you, you can't see too much here, but uh, nonetheless, it's evident that there's matter being squirted out like this, okay? Although I must say that what you're really seeing is radiation and not, not the gas or the plasma itself, okay? What you're really seeing are photons, in particular, radio photons. That's what you're really seeing, okay? So this is something to be kept in mind. And... So, however, we will take the radiation to be a proxy for the matter, okay? After all, if, there was no, if the matter here was not denser than the surroundings, okay, it would not appear brighter, isn't it? So, it's, that's, it's in that sense that, that uh, you know, and radiation is always a two-body process generally. It goes, the, the intensity of radiation generally goes as n squared. It's a two-body process. So, the denser the matter, the more the radiation. So, wherever you see excess radiation, you think that there's excess matter. That's what it is. So, I just wanted to emphasize that what you're really seeing here is not matter itself, as you would in a lab. What you're really seeing here are photons that, that, that are being emitted and there are reaching telescopes of the Earth, and after a, lot, a great deal of image processing, you, uh, you, you obtain these spectacular images such as these, and from these you surmise, you infer that matter is being ejected from the central point, which is often called the nucleus, in both directions, okay? And it, out here, what happens is, I mean, uh, uh, this is what's called a hot spot, and this is called a blowback, this is, uh, these are called lobes. So most likely what's happening is this matter is being, is, is being, you know, blown out in the form of a jet. The geometry, the picture, I mean, the reason we call them jets uh, is pretty obvious from the picture. These do look like very narrow, very collimated jets, right? At this point, it's almost as if the jet is running into a wall. And when the jet runs into a wall, what happens? The matter splatters all over, okay? And so this is really backflowing matter, okay? And these are radio lobes. And these are hot spots. This is where the maximum dissipation takes place. All of this is not terribly important to us 
for uh, the purposes of our present discussion. Uh, our present discussion mainly centers on the fact that there, there, there are very collimated jets of matter that are being ejected from the central nucleus. That is it. And how is this happening? This is essentially what we want to discuss. Okay, and just to give you an idea, from here to here is is uh, often it depends. I mean, this is just one such jet. There are many many such jets. Okay, and uh, it's also been surmised that the speeds of these jets are often relativistic, and they're relativistic and uh, they're definitely definitely supersonic. No doubt about it. Okay, uh, yeah. So the other point I wanted to make is is the extent of these jets. The extent of these jets is truly staggering. They are mega often often they are several megaparsecs long. Huge monster jets from here to here would often be several megaparsecs. Okay, so the question we want to address well, there are several questions that can be addressed in the context of astrophysical jets, such as the one. we saw okay uh, one is how produced how do they remain collimated for so long right and you can see that right i mean this thing this 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 jet remains incredibly narrow and collimated over really long distances how long up you know um, uh, all the way to megaparsecs right okay so that's often the second question and uh, many other questions that can be that can be addressed uh, for instance uh, Are jets stopped? Stopped meaning like this out here. Okay, it seems as if the jet has run into a kind of, some kind of a wall and it splatters out there, and it you know uh, it, it is essentially um, you know splattering all over, and that's that's what leads to this 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 these lobes. Right. Okay, but however, in this case, we will confine ourselves just to this first question. How are they produced? And, um, right. So you see, we will apply, obviously, that's the reason we discussed the De Laval nozzle so much. We will apply. concept of the De Laval nozzle. But you might ask how? How? I mean, how is the De Laval nozzle concept applicable here? The first thing to remember is that in our discussions of the De Laval nozzle, we prescribed And from the prescription, we said, well, here's a converging nozzle, here's a diverging nozzle. In other words, we are prescribing exactly how the area varies as a function of x, right? And from this prescription, we are deriving how the Mach number varies, or equivalently, how the pressure Okay, that's how we have been doing this. For astrophysical jets, we will do the opposite. We will prescribe in our discussion in in discussing jets, we will do the opposite. We prescribe the 
the pressure gradient and derive dA dx. Okay, and also the behavior of the Mach number. Of course, of course, that's the whole point, isn't it? But the main thing is you, you are prescribing the pressure gradient and, and from that it's as though the pressure gradient is equivalent to a dA dx. That's what it is. There's no physical nozzle as such. So again, uh, let's be a little more specific. So what we're saying is that here is, I don't have a very good cartoon of this. So here is a central object. Okay, this thing. This thing the central object, right? And around the central object, there is really, you know, th th there is very dense medium. Okay, so what I'm, I'm, I'm uh, there's really dense medium, very high pressure medium. Okay, so there's matter being squirted out somehow. Okay, and there's very high pressure medium. Okay, and, 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 and when it's squirted out, when it's initially being squirted out, the Mach number is less than one. Okay, and there's very high pressure medium and it's it's squeezing, you know, and, and this is subsonic flow and you are, uh, however, why is there very dense medium around? Because this is a very compact object and compact objects always like to accrete matter. Stuff is accreting onto the compact object. So in the vicinity of the compact object, you would expect the density to be large and therefore the pressure also to be large. But as you move away, as you move away, you would expect that the density falls off and therefore the pressure falls off. Okay. And it's that is essentially equivalent to a, a, a nozzle that is converging. Rather, I'm sorry, uh, in the very vicinity, in the very vicinity, Okay, as you transition from here to here, the density still keeping, keeps increasing up until some point. So that would be, uh, uh, so dp dx is greater than zero up until say, up until somewhere here. So this would be equivalent to a converging nozzle until somewhere here. Okay, so this would be something like a converging nozzle. And we know that converging nozzles for subsonic flows keep accelerating the flow. But as you move, so all this is very much in the vicinity of the uh, central object, right? But as you move away from the central object, okay, away meaning sufficiently far away, okay, sufficiently from the nucleus pressure drops in other words dp dx becomes less than zero right so and and dp dx becoming less than zero is as good as a diverging nozzle What you have to engineer is that it the use and the, the flow used to be subsonic until and so so the other thing is this is not to scale this drawing is not to scale okay this is very very close to the object and all of these are very, quite far from the object from the central object okay so very close what's happening is the flow is subsonic and you have to you have to engineer in your mind the concept is that that uh, Around the time that dpd exchanges sign from greater than zero to less than zero, you have reached the sonic point. And so, to the right of the sonic point, you know, uh, you know, the, the the flow now becomes supersonic. And once the flow becomes supersonic, you the dpdx becomes less than zero, and that is as good as a diverging nozzle. And we know that a diverging nozzle uh, uh, serves to accelerate a supersonic flow. This is a, this is exactly like uh, the, the Laval now, and, and and that's what we want. We we want the flow to keep accelerating and becoming more and more supersonic. Okay, 
uh, more and more supersonic so that it, it can travel to, uh, you know, it, it can accelerate so that, it, you know, essentially the bulk kinetic energy of the flow is uh, increases, keeps increasing so that, uh, you know, it, it, it can go on for long distances, as long as a megaparsec. Okay, up until the point where something else happens, the density of the interstellar medium increases so much that, you know, the f flow cannot push against the density of the, uh, against the interstellar medium anymore, and it comes to kind of a halt and it splatters all over, but that's not our concern right now. Our concern is trying to figure out how the flow becomes supersonic and how it keeps accelerating, and this is how. So you can see that in, in prescribing the pressure variation very close to the central object and very far from the central object, we are essentially creating a de facto de Laval nozzle. And so this is how the concept of a de Laval nozzle is very, very closely intertwined uh, to this question. How astrophysical jets are produced. Okay, so that's all we have to say. Thank you.